So this tower here in Basel, Switzerland, or Baal, as I say in, in French, probably from Baal, is called the Biz. And um, it is a, um, it's a dominion that uh, it doesn't belong to Switzerland. It's like the Vatican. It's by Patrick M. Wood from August Review. Preface, when David Rockefeller and Zbigniew Brzezinski founded the Trilateral Commission in 1973, the intent was to create a new international economic order. To this end, they brought together 300 elite corporate, political, and academic leaders from North America, Japan, and Europe. Few people believed us when we wrote about their nefarious plans back then. Now we look back and clearly see that they did what they said they were going to do, Globalization is upon us like an 8.6 magnitude earthquake. The question is, how did they do it? Keep in mind they have no public mandate from any country in the world. They didn't even have the raw political muscle, especially in democratic countries where voting is allowed. They didn't have global dictatorial powers. Indeed, how did they do it? The answer is is the Bank for International Settlements, BIS. Self-described as the bank for central bankers that controls the vast global banking system with the precision of a Swiss watch. This report offers a concise summation of BIS history, structure, and current activities. Introduction. The famous currency expert, Dr. Franz Pick, once stated, the destiny of the currency is and always will be the destiny of a nation. With the advent of rampant globalization, this concept can certainly be given a global context as well. The destiny of currencies are and always will be the destiny of the world. Even though the Bank for International Settlements is the oldest international banking operation in the world, it is a low-profile organization shunning all publicity and notoriety. As a result, there is very little critical analysis written about this important financial organization. Further, much of what is written about it is tainted by its own self-effacing literature. The Bank for International Settlements can be compared to a stealth bomber. It flies high and fast, is undetected, and has a small crew and carries a huge payload. By contrast, however, the bomber answers to a chain of command and must be refueled by outside sources. The Bank for International Settlements, as we shall see, is not accountable to any public authority and operates with complete autonomy and self-sufficiency. Leading up to founding, as we will see, the BIS was founded in 1930 during a very troubled time in history. Some knowledge of that history is critical to understanding why the BIS was formed. Some knowledge of that history is critical to understanding why the BIS was created and for whose benefit. There are three figures that play prominently in the founding of the Bank for International Settlements. Charles G. Dawes, Owen D. Young, Jalmar Schacht of Germany. Charles G. Dawes was director of the U.S. Bureau of the Budget in 1921 and served on the Allied Reparations Commission starting in 1923. His latter work on stabilizing Germany's economy earned him the Nobel Prize in 1925. After being elected vice president under President Calvin Coolidge from 1925 to 1929 and appointed ambassador to England in 1931, he resumed his personal banking career in 1932 as chairman of the board of the City National Bank and Trust in Chicago, where he remained until his death in 1951. Owen D. Young was an American industrialist. He founded RCA, Radio Corporation of America, in 1919 and was its chairman until 1933. He also served as the chairman of General Electric from 1922 to 1939. In 1932, Young sought the Democratic presidential nomination but lost to Franklin D. Roosevelt. More on Jalmar Schacht later. In the aftermath of World War I and the impending collapse of the German economy and political structure, a plan was needed to rescue and restore Germany, which would also insulate other economies in Europe from being affected adversely. The Versailles Treaty of 1919, which officially ended World War I, had imposed a very heavy reparations burden on Germany, which required a repayment schedule of 132 billion gold marks per year. 
Most historians agree that the economic upheaval caused in Germany by the Versailles Treaty eventually led to Adolf Hitler's rise to power. In 1924, the Allies appointed a committee of international bankers led by Charles G. Dawes and accompanied by J.P. Morgan agent Owen Young to develop a plan to get reparations payments back on track. Historian Carol Quigley noted that the Dawes plan was largely a J.P. Morgan production. The plan called for $800 million in foreign loans to be arranged for Germany in order to rebuild its economy. In 1924, Dawes was chairman of the Allied Committee of Experts, hence the Dawes Plan. He was replaced as chairman by Owen Young in 1929, with direct support by J.P. Morgan. The Young Plan of 1928 put more teeth into the Dawes Plan, which many viewed as a strategy to subvert virtually all German assets to back a huge mortgage held by the United States bankers. Neither Dawes nor Young represented anything more than banking interests. After all, World War I was fought by governments using borrowed money made possible by the international banking community. The banks had a vested interest in having those loans repaid. In 1924, the president of Reichsbank, Germany's central bank at that time, was Jalmar Schacht. He had already had a prominent role in creating the Dawes Plan, along with German industrialist Fritz Thyssen and other prominent German bankers and industrialists. The Young Plan was so odious to the Germans that many credited it as a precondition to Hitler's rise in power. Fritz Dyson, a leading Nazi industrialist, stated, I turned to the National Socialist Party only after I became convinced that the fight against the Young Plan was unavoidable if complete collapse of Germany was to be prevented.